Okay, hello and welcome to your review for AHP 215 exam number two. This is the essay version of the exam. Uh, I'm going to go through the material that you are likely to see on the exam uh, and I'll give you some extra hints uh, as well as even in some cases uh, page numbers in the textbook if you want to find some of the material that way as well. So we'll start off talking about uh, a very simple term and that is rectus. Uh, the term rectus is a Latin word which means straight and we see this if we are discussing the rectus abdominis muscles which are straight up and down or the rectum which is the straight part of the large intestines or even the uh, superior or inferior rectus muscles of the eyeball. So uh, when you see the term rectus it's a very easy answer it's a one-word answer the term rectus simply means straight. Another muscle, actually, or muscle that we're going to talk about is the a large calf muscle, and it is called the gastrocnemius muscle. The gastrocnemius muscle is going to plantar flex the foot, which means it's going to cause the toes to point downward, or another way of thinking of it is it's going to lift you up onto your tippy toes. So the gastrocnemius muscle is going to have a connection via the Achilles tendon down in the calcaneus, uh, the large heel bone, which is going to uh, do the plantar flex in that way. This gets a little bit confusing because you know gastro means stomach, uh, nemius means leg, so technically this is the leg of the stomach, or the, or the stomach leg, but don't get confused by that. When you see gastrocnemius, remember that is the large calf muscle. The soleus is the smaller muscle, but I think the one I usually stress is the gastrocnemius muscle. So make sure you know about that. Uh, in the skin, we discussed a pigment called melanin, and melanin is a pigment pigment that is released from the melanocytes, which is going to help block UV radiation from making its way down to the susceptible cells in the basal layer, the stratum nasale because we're going to find that there's constantly dividing cells there and if the UV radiation makes it that far it could change the DNA to an extent which is going to cause the cells to start to change and of course when cells change and then start rapidly dividing we call that cancer. So make sure you remember that melanin is the pigment that is created by the melanocytes in the skin that are going to uh, block the UV radiation. In the brain, he said the most obvious part of the brain is the cerebrum. Uh, the cerebrum is divided into five lobes, although uh, I really only stress the four. Uh, the fifth lobe, the insula, is sort of a little more interior, a little more difficult to see. But make sure you know about the four other lobes, the uh, parietal lobes, the frontal lobe, the temporal lobes, and the occipital lobe. And they're really named uh, according to the bones that are sitting on top of them. So that kind of makes it easy to remember. When it comes to each of these lobes of the cerebrum, there are some things that I went over that I said are sort of the highlights. Uh, they do a lot of different things. Each, each area is responsible for many different things. But the ones that I kind of want you to remember, starting with the occipital lobe, is that this is where we find the visual cortex. So vision actually takes place in the back. Which is why I say it's like having eyes in the back of your head. The temporal lobes uh, have an auditory cortex, so hearing takes place here, as well as an olfactory cortex, which means uh, smell happens here. So hearing and smell happen in the temporal lobes. The parietal lobes are really sensory lobes, so a lot of sensation happens here, uh, like vibration or pain, as well as uh, the gustatory cortex, taste. So pain and taste are happening in the parietal lobes. Then the uh, frontal lobe is important because this is the area that helps to predict benefits or consequences of future actions, uh, whether it's uh, the long-term or even moment-to-moment -moment actions, things you don't, you're, not even percept, you're not even perceiving happening. So I like to remind people that it's the frontal lobe that helps to predict the future, helps to predict what's going to happen in front of you. It helps to benefit, it helps to predict the benefits and consequences of future actions. 
Continuing with the brain, uh, one area of the brain, the diencephalon, contains the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the pineal gland, or pineal gland. The pineal gland, or pineal gland, is responsible for maintaining the circadian rhythm, the wake-sleep cycle. And the way that it does this is through the release of a substance called melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that is released that helps to uh, make us feel tired when there's less sunlight and then it's released less when there's more sunlight. So don't confuse the two, melanin and melatonin. Uh, going to the skeleton a bit. We talked about, obviously we talked about all the bones and the skeleton. And I mentioned that in the lower arm we have two bones. Uh, there's the radius and the ulna. And the radius is the laterally located bone. Uh, and that is the one that follows the thumb. And the ulna is the medial, medially located bone, and it is the bone that allows for the hinging action to occur. This, and you can see actually, right here is a humerus, and then right here is actually a radius. You can see the humerus has that rounded area on the proximal end that makes up the ball and socket joint. Uh, that is different from the femur, which also has a rounded end that makes up a ball and socket joint, but the femur has a, a very obvious uh, and elongated neck to it, where this has a very short little surgical neck right about here. So the bones of the arm, uh, the radius and the ulna, remember what they do, remember where they're located. Okay. Looking at the skin, I said there's three parts to the skin, and that includes the uh, epidermis, the outer layer, the dermis, which is the main layer of the skin, and the hypodermis, which is the deepest layer. The dermis, the main layer, is where we're going to find all the blood supply, we're going to find the nerves, we're going to find the hair, we're going to find the pseudoriferous glands and the sebaceous glands, which are the um, sweat and oil glands, respectively. Uh, the epidermis is made up of constantly dividing cells. It is a very, very thin layer that doesn't have any blood supply. But it is made up of these constantly dividing cells in the stratum basale layer that move their way towards the surface, and as they do, they lose their nucleus, they fill up with keratin, and they end up as these outer dead cells that help to uh, create a nice outer layer of our skin. So the epidermis is the thinnest outermost layer. Uh, the Dermis is the layer that has uh, the main components, it's the main part of the skin. And then beneath the dermis is the hypodermis, which is the fat layer. This has adipocytes, sometimes called lipocytes, but it is made up of adipocytes which are going to fill up with fat. Adipocytes um, can enlarge, they can hold more fat or shrink down and lose, and lose that fat, which is why by the time we're about five years old, we have pretty much all the fat cells that we're ever going to have. Uh, they can just enlarge or shrink down uh, as needed. Okay. Another muscle I talked about is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And the sternocleidomastoid muscle has two origins. It starts on the sternum and then also on the clavicle and inserts on the mastoid process, which of course is this bony projection right here on the temporal bone. That muscle is called the sternocleidomastoid and it is going to cause the head to move back to center and then down a bit which is why I got the nickname the prayer muscle because of the way it brings the head center and down just a little bit. Uh, let's see. Okay, going back to the brain for a moment. There is a, a neurotransmitter released from the brain called serotonin, which is mostly an inhibitory neurotransmitter that is going to be involved in things like emotion and moods and sleep. Uh, what I recommend you do is you look at page 240 in the textbook on uh, table 11-2 and it has it listed there. I think it's the third or fourth one down. You can see it. So that's serotonin, and the mostly inhibitory neurotransmitter involved in mood, emotion, and sleep. 
Another one that uh, you'll see listed is dopamine. Now, dopamine is important, but there's a disease that occurs when a patient has a deficiency in dopamine, and that is called Parkinson's disease. There's insufficient amount of dopamine being released from an area called the substantia nigra, which causes um, these different signs to appear in the patient. And the two that I want you to remember specifically is a